Folks, I want to welcome you. Are we going to go ahead and get started? I want to welcome you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Brett Bowden, and I'm the Interim Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development here at the uh, Rubenstein School and help to, to manage the graduate program here. Um, this is the 38th Annual Graduate Symposium. This started in 1984. Okay. And uh, I, I thought it might be kind of interesting. I, I, I ran across a file in our archives that uh, has all of the presenters of all of the symposia uh, through the years. And uh, in 1984, there were a few names that stood out to me. I just wanted to, to mention them. Uh, there was uh, an Anthony uh, Pisanelli, who's currently the vice president for uh, Charter and Environmental, who is a uh, an environmental consulting firm in Boston. Mark Mazzola, who's a nationally known pl uh, plant pathologist at Washington State University with the USDA ARS. Uh, Kim Marshall, who's a staff scientist with the National Center for Biotechnology and Information. Um, all still active and got their master's degrees here. Closer to home, Rich Hopkins, who is a senior analyst at uh, DEC, uh, is a graduate of the program and presented in 1984. Kathy Jamison is the uh, manager for solid waste, uh, for the solid waste program at Vermont DEC. And Joy, uh, Jay Appleton is a senior programmer working uh, with the city of Burlington. And most interestingly uh, to me, and some old timers here, and well, some people who have known things for a while, Carolyn, I won't say old timers, <laughs> John Shane and Paul Schauberg both gave presentations in 1984. John Shane is a much loved uh, lecturer, uh, professor here at the Ruben State School who taught, in, who taught dendrology among other things for many years. Paul Schauberg is still a very active uh, research scientist with the USDA uh, here. All gave presentations in 1984. So there's a couple of takeaways uh, from this to me. One of them is there, there is a career out there. You know, <laughs> there, there, are, there are great things uh, that uh, you can do. Um, and the other is how many people who were here in 1984 stayed in Vermont and contributed to the, the environment and the life and recreation that we uh, enjoy here. Um, so uh, I just want to note that uh, you guys are the engine of research at the Rubenstein School. And that enterprise is, a, is an eight to nine million dollar a year uh, enterprise. It's a major part of what we do in the Rubenstein School. You folks make it happen. And that that has consequences as well, good consequences for our teaching mission and for our service mission as well. So this is just a, a, a crucial component of what we uh, do here. So I'm very excited to hear about uh, what you're going to talk about uh, tonight. I'm even more excited to see what you're going to do next uh, in, in your tenure here and then as you go on in, in your careers. And I just want to give a, a, a shout out here, big thanks to uh, Jess Wickle and Abby Reck who are, who are moderating uh, and to uh, uh, Ora Alonso Rodriguez and Caitlin Drasher who are uh, providing the technical support. And I would be completely remiss if I did not thank Lissy Laurie I think you all know that Lissy stepped into an unexpected and pretty horrific gap for us early on and has just done yeoman service uh, uh, for the graduate program and uh, just want to thank her tremendously for making this night happen, but uh, also all she's done uh, over the last six or eight months to uh, make sure that our graduate program moves forward. So Lissy, thank you. Thank you. Um, you want to say um, I look forward to these events every year and um, I look at you now and I think you are the why I come to work excited every day. So I'm Nancy Matthews, I'm the Dean School. If I haven't met you before, I hope I do have a chance. And you really probably now don't appreciate or have the perspective of how important your work is. For Brett to say that you are an engine, I say you are the lifeblood of the school. You are doing the work 
that uh, probably many of your advisors wish they could do in the field with you, but now that they're your advisors, you're doing this amazing work. And you are generating new information, new ideas. You are on the cutting edge of science. And that's an exciting place to be. And it kind of gives me chills thinking about it. I used to be many years ago, uh, but I, I'm happy to see this transition and to look at all of you and to hear about your work and to know that we're in really good hands in the future. You have a big uh, lift going ahead of you with uh, the rapid change in, in climate and uh, at the global level. And you are going to be the leaders. If you heard what Breck was saying about that many years ago, people who are in your chairs are now the leaders of companies, of nonprofits in government. You are going to be those people very soon. So it's just a joy to uh, see you being in these seats and knowing that you're doing amazing work. Just want to congratulate all of you. And I also want to say that uh, many of you started when Carolyn goodwin Keithner was in Lizzie's role. So, Karen, I'm going to give you a shout out also because he helped launch many of these students. So. Okay, so I'm not going to take any more time. Brett, thanks for bringing the history back in. And good luck, everybody. Have fun. And uh, we'll see you on the other side. All right, well, hey folks who are staying up in this room, I'm Jess Weichel, I'll be your moderator. Um, we still have a few minutes before the five o'clock start time, so if you're presenting or want to see the presentations in the room downstairs, now would be the time to head there and get settled, and I'll start introducing our first speaker in about five minutes. <laughs>
Great. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, we're in session one of the research symposium, and I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, so if anyone's tuning in through Teams, the live chat and Q&A function is unfortunately not working right now uh, due to a Microsoft issue. Um, so if you happen to be viewing a presentation and want to ask a question, um, you can email A-A-L-O-N SOR at ubm.edu and we'll try to get your question answered. Also be aware there's about a 20 second lag, so ask your question as soon as you have it and we'll try to include it live. And one other note on introductions, I'll be introducing each one of our speakers tonight with uh, two truths and a lie about them, only I won't tell you which is which, so there'll be a little bit of entertainment as we get started. So we'll be opening up with Eva Kinnebrew. She's a PhD student or candidate working with Jillian Galford. Her tru two truths and a lie, childhood edition, are one, she doesn't have a middle name, but desperately wanted one as a kid. Therefore, she made one up and for years went by Eva Care Bear Kinnebrew. <laughs> two, she had two beloved rabbits as pets growing up, which she named Sugar and Spice. And three, she did karate as a kid, but was eventually kicked out because she couldn't follow instructions and was too creative in the movements. She'll be talking about the impacts of agricultural tarping on soils, arthropods, and weeds. So go ahead and take a look. Um, sugar and spice were not rabbits, they were hamsters. Okay, <laughs> but they did exist. <laughs> So yeah, I'm Eva Kinnebrew. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate and I'll be talking about research I did over this last summer on tarps. So the first question we have to clear up is what is tarping? So tarps are sort of ground cover, usually impermeable plastic. They're used before planting seeds, so they're different than um, plastic mulch, which is used while plants are growing, but tarps go on before you plant the seeds. And they are used for the purpose of suppressing weeds, controlling erosion, and hastening decomposition, for example, of like cover crops. Uh, in the Northeast, there's two main types of tarps. Um, most people are using the black silage tarps on the top right corner, and those work via occultation or shading out the weeds um, as they start to grow. And then there's also these clear plastic tarps, which work via solarization or heating the the soil and the weeds up to intolerable temperatures. There's a lot of interest in tarping in Vermont. So this is the Vermont Veg and Berry Growers Association agenda for, it had a whole day that was dedicated to tarps. So people are definitely interested and this practice is growing, but there's a lot that we don't know. So there's a lot of questions uh, about the differences between black and clear plastic, how well they work in certain scenarios, Farmers ask me all the time about the like specific mechanisms by which tarps work. Um, farmers have hundreds about what tarps do to soil nutrients, but that's not so well tested. Then there's questions about performance in different soils and settings. So some farms like swear by tarps and other farms have had mixed results. And then if you know anything about me, I have done a lot of work on soil arthropods. So when I was introduced to the world of tarping, my first question was how does it affect the soil arthropod community? But my research question is pretty broad, so I look at the effects of silage tarps and clear plastic tarps on not only soil arthropods, but also weeds, um, soil properties, and crop outcomes. This research was done in Vermont, in Chittenden County, on three farms, so Diggers Murph and Intervale Community Farm, which are in the Intervale, and then Catamount Farm, it's the UVM Horticulture Farm, which is in South Burlington. Um, I had three different treatments, silage tarp, clear plastic, and a control. And the control, um, we applied frequent disturbance to sort of mimic what an organic farm would do if it wasn't tarping and also not using herbicides. So here are some nice photos of the three farms and the treatment. So there are six replicates of the three treatments at three farms. So that's 54 plots in total. Note also that each farm had a slightly different soil type. Um, tarps were on the fields for 25 days, which was about late May to late June. And then also note that after we removed the tarps, we planted mixed lettuce and trapped weed and crop growth during that time. So here's a concept map of the tarping system. And in red, I have all the things that I measured. But I don't have time in this presentation to talk about everything, so I'm going to focus on soil temperature, soil arthropods, weed cover, and soil nutrients. 
Let's get into it. Here are the results for soil temperature, and these are uh, weekly trends. You can see the dips, um, uh, you know, for the day and the night. And I have surface temperatures so that would be right under the tarps or right on top of the soil in the control plot, and then soil temperature 10 centimeters deep. So pretty surprising um, to see how much the tarps heat up the soil. So the clear plastic tarps heated the surface temperature up by like 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and the side of the tarp heated up by 20 degrees uh, Fahrenheit over the control, and that's you know at the the peak. Uh, temperature and then even 10 centimeters below the surface. I was shocked by this. Um, the clear plastic really heats up the soil. So that was pretty incredible to me that these soils 10 centimeters deep were over 110 um, Fahrenheit at one point. So here are the results for soil nitrate. These results are sort of a mixed bag depending on the farm. I have uh, a possible reason why that is. But this is the change in nitrate from before and after the tarps were on. And you can see that for Catamount and Digger's Farm, it does seem like the tarps are increasing um, nitrate availability. At ICF, Intervale Community Farm, we didn't quite see that. And that might be because they use a very slow releasing fertilizer. So if I had sampled a few weeks later, we might have seen something. All right, so let's get into soil arthropods. Um, I had two different sampling techniques which targeted above ground and below ground arthropods, so pitfall traps and soil cores and then followed by Berlesi funnels. I collected soil arthropods five times during the summer, uh, four tarps, during tarps, and one, three, and five weeks after tarps to understand their recovery. Here's a little overview. I collected a crazy amount of arthropods, especially above ground arthropods, so over 80,000. Over half of those were springtails, so there was a lot of one kind of arthropod, but that made up 22 total orders, and then below ground there was just under 1,000 total organisms and 17 total taxonomic orders. Here are the most common arthropods, so as I just mentioned, a lot of springtails, also a good amount of mites, and spiders, different kinds of ants, and then two different kinds of beetles that were pretty common. But I also want to note that um, we had a huge diversity of beetles, and this was fun for me because I really love beetles. I think they're very beautiful, and they are extremely taxonomically diverse. So ground beetles, um, which can be beneficial arthropods on farms because they can eat um, pests. Then you also have some pests, like weevils can be agricultural pests. The larva quick beetles, wireworms, also a nemesis to farmers. Let's look at some of the data. This is the richness of morpho species, and you can see through time how it changed. So pre-tarp, as we would hope, the numbers were more or less the same, but when the tarps were on, the richness of above-ground arthropods drastically dipped. Um, but after, they pretty much recovered. For the below-ground arthropods, you kind of see a similar trend, um, though in all the flocks, the richness went down over the summer. It was a really dry um, month when we were sampling, so that's why I know when the July rain starts. Um, but it does seem like the averages are slightly below uh, the control for the tarps. Let's get into weed surveys um, and those results. So again, we um, surveyed weeds weekly for five weeks as the crops were growing after we removed the tarps. We noted what weeds were present and then we approximated their cover. Also note that we did not hoer weed the plots after the tarps were removed. So the tarps, they do what they promised to do. Um, you can see here the two tarp treatments, which by the end of our sampling period had around 30% coverage in the plots, compared to the control, which had a crazy amount of coverage in the plot, so like 90%. And you can see that in those photos over there. The control plot looked absolutely crazy by the end. You can barely see the mixed lettuce that we grew. Um, also true that the number of weed species was less in the control, sorry, was less in the tarp plot than the control plot. So that makes it a bit easier for farmers to uh, control weeds. But this one weed, purslane, which I actually misspelled up there, purslane, um, it grew under the clear plastic tarps. It is a sort of succulent and 
uh, it did not mind the hot temperatures at all. So that is important for farmers to know, farmers who have purslane on their field like Catamount does. All right, so here are a summary of results um, with some surprises since I didn't discuss everything here. Uh, but I showed you that soil temperature increased with the tarps. Um, we found that soil moisture mostly decreased with the tarps. Soil arthropod mostly decreased with the tarps, so the above ground do seem to recover. Decreased weed cover, which is great for farmers. Increased soil nutrients, which is great for farmers. And then I didn't show you this, but it also significantly increased crop growth rate. So tarps do seem like they are providing a lot of benefits to farms, though I would um, love to see more long-term experiments looking at the soil arthropod community over time. And then I also wanted to note that in the next steps of this project, I'm going to be looking at the interactions between all of these variables and also digging into the soil arthropod data a lot more. So with that, um, thank you to everyone who contributed to this project, including the farm uh, partners, my amazing uh, research assistants, Carla and Sophia, members of the Agroecology and Livelihoods Collaborative, which inspired and supported this by committee, and then people that helped me in the lab and in the field. And of course, my funding sources, especially Northeast SAIR, which funded this project specifically. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions, so go ahead. Aura? How long has tarping been like an agricultural practice in Vermont? Is it something we have to do or has it been used for us? Of course. So Ada asked how long tarpene has been um, in use in Vermont or in the Northeast, yeah. uh, how long it's been kind of popular. So tarps have actually been around for like a really long time. Like I have found papers on tarps dating from like the 1980s, but it's really only increased in popularity um, in farms in Vermont in the, and in the Northeast in like the last five to 10 years. So that it kind of I don't know, I feel like some people started using it and then it just like spread because the, the benefits to weeds were so marked. Um, yes, in the back. Um, where do you think, do you think the arthropod is just avoiding the area just because it's so hot or what, what, what's the, where do you think the difference is? Yeah, so for the above ground arthropods, they are mobile, like they might be able to crawl out. I think. It would be really interesting to do a size analysis because my guess is that the bigger organisms can just crawl away, whereas the smaller organisms may be dying because it's too hot and they're not as mobile. Um, so the above ground organisms, yeah, I think that they could just be migrating away and then migrating back once they're gone. But the smaller organisms, including what's in the soil, I think that it's possible that they are dying. Yeah. Um, Mahalia? Do you know if it's what a good question because I was just dealing with this this week as I was trying to get rid of my tarps um, and I wasn't able to because they had dirt on them and the recycling center said no we can't take the, like plastic film that is dirty at all. So huge issue farmers do try to re like reuse the tarps as many times as they can. Also, the clear plastic is often recycled from hoop houses. So that's the clear plastic that I used was donated to me from a farm that had it on a hoop house for many years. But yeah, the plastic implications of tarping is like a huge question. Yeah. And that's all the questions. Find me after. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thanks, Eva. Yeah. All right, um, so our, before I introduce the next speaker, um, just another announcement for those who have joined us online since the first speaker. Uh, unfortunately, the online chat feature is not working. Um, so if you do end up with questions you wanna get to the speakers, you can email them to our, our tech person. Um, that email address is aalonsor at ubm.edu. I mean, there is about a 20 second delay between uh, what you see on the screen and what's happening in the classroom. So if you do have a question, just um, try to email it in as soon as you have it and hopefully we can answer it. Uh, now we'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Mahalia Clark. She's a PhD student working with Jillian Galford. Uh, here are her two truths and a lie. 
One, she has lived in six countries. Two, she can do a handstand. And three, she plays fiddle in a local band. And she'll be talking today about human migration in a changing world. How do climate, landscape, and natural hazards shape migration patterns across the US? Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, my name is Manelia Clark. Um, and over the last few months, I've been studying uh, human migration across the United States in relation to features of the landscape, climate, and various extreme weather events. And before I get started, I just want to stop and thank uh, one of my uh, colleagues who's been working closely with me on this project, Dr. F.M. McCoyne, as well as my advisor, Dr. Julie Belford, and um, support from the Quest Program and the Gun Institute. So yeah, our questions were around how features of the climate, landscape, and extreme weather events affect net migration rates across the US. So for the purposes of this study, we use all county level data. So our net migration rates are just the number of people moving into a given county minus the number of people moving out of that county. And in particular, we were interested in whether people were moving towards or away from the dangers of extreme weather events. As climate change advances, um, we're going to most likely see warmer and warmer temperatures across the United States, and we've already begun to see that warming trend. Each of these maps is a 30-year temperature average um, for successive 10-year periods, um, and the color is showing how each 30-year average compares to the 100-year average for the previous century. So you can see from the last two maps for the two most recent periods that things are starting to get a lot better, and we've already kind of seen some um, some warming in the average temperatures. The color bar at the bottom shows that that dark red color is about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit warming relative to that long term average. But you can see in the most recent map from the 1990s up to 2020 that large areas of the country are, are pretty much saturated in that dark red. That map isn't even showing the full variation anymore. And to give an example from closer to home here in Burlington, We've actually experienced two degrees Fahrenheit warming in our winter temperatures just between the two most recent periods. So just between that and As climate change advances, we can expect to see not only warmer and warmer baseline temperatures, but also more and more frequent and severe extreme weather events of things like hurricanes, wildfires, and heat waves. Hurricanes are mostly an issue on the East Coast, but they affect everywhere from Texas up to Maine. They mostly affect coastal areas, but they can even have pretty devastating effects pretty far inland, as we've seen here in Vermont with Hurricane Irene. Wildfires affect large areas of the country, particularly across the West, but they can also affect areas in the East where people might be less aware of the dangers of wildfires. Heat waves affect areas along the West and East Coast, but also large portions of the middle of the country, um, particularly across the Big Plains along the Mississippi River. They're less common in mountainous areas. Um, and it's useful to note that heat waves are usually defined in relation to the baseline temperatures for a given area. So places like Arizona or Texas or Florida, people there are pretty used to very hot temperatures and many of them are equipped with air conditioning. Um, so it's gonna take pretty high temperatures before a place like that is issued with a heat advisory, where somewhere like Seattle or Vermont, where people are not as adapted to high temperatures, um, they're gonna see a heat advisory at comparatively lower hot temperatures. So how bad are these events really? Why do we need to worry about them? Well, every year, these types of events cause hundreds of deaths and do billions of dollars in damage across the country. And heat waves in particular are thought to be one of the leading causes of weather-related deaths. And this estimate from the CDC is around 700 deaths a year. It actually includes deaths where heat was listed as one of the underlying causes of death. So it's fairly conservative. Other studies have suggested that extreme heat could actually be a factor in thousands of deaths a year across the country. So, those were extreme weather events. To give you a sense of migration trends over the last decade, we have a map here. Um, in red, we have statistically significant migration hotspots. So, these are areas where more people are moving in than moving out. Um, you can see these migration hotspots across a large portion of the South, and particularly around some major cities. Most of Florida, Florida is growing at a crazy rate. Uh, areas 
large areas of Texas, and many areas across the West. And just a quick note, you're going to see a lot of holes in all of my maps. Um, these were uh, statistical outliers in the net migration data, which we excluded for statistical assumptions. Um, so just to explain why they're holes. Um, in blue, we have uh, migration cold spots where more people are moving out of those areas than in. We have those across much of the plains along the Mississippi River and large portions of New York State and West Virginia. So how do all of those migration trends relate to climate and extreme weather? Um, in order to explore that question, we built a spatial auto directed model for net migration rates. And this is pretty much uh, very similar to your ordinary least flows regression model, but with some extra terms to account for spatial autocorrelation since we're dealing with all this spatial time level data. Um, to control for a bunch of different factors that might affect migration rates, we included uh, variables related to various socioeconomic factors, let's see here, um, various environmental factors, particularly related to baseline summer temperatures, as well as various uh, features of the physical landscape, and then a handful of different natural hazards, including the extreme weather events that we've been discussing. To give you a sense of the spatial variation in some of those climate variables, here are maps of our winter temperatures, winter cloud cover, summer humidity, and then this metric of relatively cool summer. So that's the negative residual of July temperatures over January temperatures. So it's kind of a metric of how hot or cold the summer is relative to what you would expect from winter temperatures. So in blue, we have areas with a relatively cool, mild summer. In the pale color, we have areas with relatively hot summers. So when we ran our models uh, controlling for all these other factors, what we found is uh, on the whole across the lower 48, people have been generally moving away from heat waves, you know, this negative relationship, away from hurricanes, but towards areas with frequent wildfires. Uh, as for baseline temperatures, people have been moving towards areas with higher winter temperatures, so they're generally moving towards warmer, warmer winter climate, but um, they're also moving away from areas with mild summers towards those areas with uh, warmer summers, which is a bit of a change from what the literature found for previous decades, where people were moving, say, towards mountainous areas with more mild summers. Um, one way to think about this is if you compare two similar cities, say, ones with similar population size or that were situated a similar distance from the coast, you find people moving away from the city that experiences more frequent heat waves or more frequent hurricanes, but towards that city which experiences more frequent wildfires. Um, so to give you a kind of a sense of the spatial distribution again, um, we can see that we have migration hotspots in places like Las Vegas and Phoenix and large areas of Texas, which are situated in these kind of um, places with higher, relatively high hot summers. As for wildfires, since they affect so much of the West where we have all these migration hotspots, um, we also see that people are generally moving towards areas that are affected by more frequent wildfires. And this could potentially suggest that for many people, the danger of wildfires don't yet outweigh uh, the perceived benefits of life in these areas. Uh, in particular, you could think about people moving somewhere like Denver um, because they're thinking about the beautiful mountainous landscape and the potential for great outdoor recreation opportunities, um, but they might be kind of unaware of, of the potential danger for wildfires. At the same time, some literature has shown that um, when people are moving to these areas, many of them are moving to the wildland urban interface. So think about areas on the exurban and suburban areas on the outskirts of, of these um, cities where many people are moving there kind of in these forested or mountainous landscapes. And as more and more people move there and build more houses and infrastructure, they're actually uh, finding increased rates of human spark wildfires. So part of this positive relationship between migration and wildfire could even be partly due to increased human cost fires. Overall, as climate change advances, we're going to see warmer and warmer baseline temperatures and more and more frequent um, fire prone conditions. So these relationships could become more problematic and more people could be moving into these dangers. Thank you very much for your attention and I'd love to hear any questions or comments.
this is super interesting. I'm just wondering if you had any, um, if there's any data about like, employment opportunities as well with some of these regions and how um, you know, that might also factor into migration benefits too. Yeah, so we had, um, we controlled for a uh, human development index, which encompasses income, uh, education, and health variables, as well as unemployment rates. So you can see people are generally moving towards places with this higher human development index, which are mostly more urban, like dense population areas, and moving away from places with high unemployment. Um, so that's definitely a factor. And I think, um, you see, we have like <laughs> relatively low I swear these model. Um, for many people, I mean, migration is a very personal decision, like where you're moving. It could be due to family reasons, but a major one is your job, right? So um, we were mostly looking at these environmental factors, which are going to play a relatively minor role for many people, but can still have a big effect for people who enjoy outdoor recreation. Other questions? Okay. How do you think that COVID and all the migration that happened because of COVID will like affect migration? That is a great question, and that's the question that I'm interested in looking at for my future work. Um, I think so. It's really hard to say. Um, there's a lot of interesting trends of people kind of moving more towards suburban areas and rural areas because now they don't have to commute to a job, um, but that could be limited by broadband access. Um, but there, there definitely seems to have been a trend of people like trying to move to like bigger, bigger space, you know, have a bigger house, have more access to nature. But at the same time, no one's sure how permanent these trends are going to be. Um, it might be that, you know, a year from now, as things are more open, um, many more people might move back to their jobs. Although it's kind of starting to shake out like that we might see some more permanent changes. So it's going to be really interesting to see. Okay. Is there a way with your data that you could separate these trends by socioeconomic groups or by, by racial or ethnic groups to see if they differ? That would be really interesting. Um, there are some research groups who, who crunch all the census numbers and break it down by race and ethnicity and age bracket and socioeconomic um, bracket. Um, they haven't done that yet for 2020. It takes them like three years, which um, is why I wouldn't be trying to re replicate it myself. Um, but as for specifically uh, uh, income levels, the IRS has migration data broken out by uh, by income bracket. And so that is another thing that I would be really interested in looking at is, um, yeah, how basically who can afford to move where um, and how far by looking at some of that income uh, just out of the data. Uh, Oh, cool. Yeah. One more really quick question, if there is one. Uh -huh. Right at the very end, you're saying that, that climate changes are going to keep going, and that there's a trends will remain the same. We've got the trends that remain the same. What have you thought about the trends changing in the direction of changing the Oh, certainly. I think. Um, I think uh, we've, we've kind of seen changes in, in these trends over time. So, I mean, we, we were looking at uh, migration data for the last decade, but um, for instance, we saw that reversal in the trend towards like more mild summer temperatures. In, in the 70s, people were moving more towards mountainous areas with cooler summers. More recently, maybe um, with more access to AC, people have been moving more towards the southwest and, and Florida and the hot areas. So it, it might be that, um, it might be that as things get even hotter, you'll see a response and people might adapt. So definitely this can't, um, this is kind of looking at long-term past trends and might have no bearing at all on future trends depending on how quickly people adapt and respond as things change. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, um, so our next speaker is Sarah Brickman. She's a master's candidate in Carol Adair's lab, and her research, research focuses on greenhouse gas emissions and nitrogen cycling within agricultural systems. Here are her two truths and a lie. 
One, Sarah was in a youth circus in her hometown. Two, she plays the tenor saxophone in her spare time. And three, she has previously worked on campaigns to stop deforestation. Sarah will be talking about quantifying greenhouse gas emissions in response to different nitrogen application methods and sources in northeastern hayfields. Really, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Jess, for the introduction, and thanks, everyone, for being here today. Um, I'll be presenting on some of the research that I've been doing as part of my master's thesis. So in Vermont, there are a lot of growing concerns about water quality, which are sparking uh, the search for solutions in a variety of sectors, from urban development to agriculture. And it's estimated that agriculture is responsible for 38% of phosphorus loading to Lake Champlain or Lake Champlain um, Basin. So it's really sparking motivation for farmers in the state to look for solutions that keep nutrients out of our waterways and in their fields. One such practice that people have been examining is manure injection, which is an alternative to surface broadcast application, which is the more common way to spread manure on fields. So unlike broadcast application, manure injection actually places manure within the soil profile so that when it rains, you don't have manure running off the field, it's already in your soil. This is a little demonstration of how manure injection works. This metal disc actually puts a slot in the soil and the manure is pumped out of the tube following the slot. So the injector is moving this way towards me, you can imagine. And the manure is being pumped into that slot as that metal disc is cutting into the soil. This is what a hay field looks like after injection on the left. The dark bands are where the manure has been injected into the soil. And the other side is an example of surface broadcast application where the manure has just been spread on the surface without any incorporation. So as I've said, at this point, manure is sounding like potentially a pretty good solution for farmers because we can reduce water pollution through manure injection and also retain nitrogen in the field because it's not lost through runoff. It's also not lost through off-gassing of ammonia. It stays in that soil. But unfortunately, there's a catch where some studies have shown that manure injection can actually increase greenhouse gas emissions, particularly nitrous oxide, which is 265 times more powerful than CO2. So even if the fluxes of nitrous oxide are small, they're still of great concern. So it's really important that we need to to examine the trade-offs of using this practice, especially as it's promoted more in the state. Before I describe exactly what I've been researching and the objectives of my study, I want to describe in a little bit more depth why manure injection can potentially increase emissions. So for CO2, um, you're increasing disturbance with injection because as those images showed, you're cutting a slot in the soil, you're opening it up. And whenever you increase soil disturbance, you're providing an opportunity for any sort of organic matter in the soil to be broken down as it's made more available to microbes and decomposition then produces carbon dioxide through microbial respiration. You're also adding carbon into the soil, which manure as a whole is going to do, but that manure um, is being placed in the soil profile so that organic matter, that organic carbon in the manure is more readily available to microbes right away. With nitrous oxide, Kind of the theory behind why manure injection can increase these emissions is because the manure slurry, which has a lot of water in it, it's very wet, is being placed in the profile. You have the same that carbon that I mentioned, and also you're retaining more nitrogen, which is good, but in the case of nitrous oxide, uh, can lead to more emissions because you're making the soil really wet, which is um, conducive to denitrification. And then you have the carbon readily available, which microbes need for denitrification. And then you have excess, potentially not excess, but potentially more nitrogen in the soil than you would with other forms of manure application, which can then spur denitrification in nitrous oxide emissions, which are a byproduct of this process. So um, to describe what I've actually been measuring over the past two years, um, I've been part of a study with Heather Darby and Carolyn Dare. Heather Darby works for UVM Extension, where we have been quantifying nitrous oxide emissions and carbon dioxide emissions from different nitrogen sources. So looking at both manure and also synthetic urea. We've also been quantifying nitrous oxide and CO2 emissions from different 
um, the newer application methods, so broadcast, surface broadcast application and injection. And finally, we're assessing what these different practices and nitrogen sources um, can do to yields and also forage quality. My city site is at Borderview Research Farm, which is in Auburn, Vermont, and they partner, they do a, a lot of different, I think there's a delay in the clicker. They do a lot of different projects with UVM Extension. Um, my study site is at Hayfield, and the Dare Lab and Heather Darby have partnered on similar projects in the past, but this is the first time that we're looking at these practices in a perennial system versus an annual cropping system. So we're interested to see whether the fluxes are different in this kind of environment. It's mostly a, a mixture of grasses and clover and you know, some images of the field. Um, we apply um, in total eight different treatment applications, but I'm only really talking about four right now, um, all over the course of one day, twice per field season. So there are two treatment application days in 2020 and two in 2021. And in the top left, you can see our control treatment, which is just water. And the top right is um, your synthetic urea application, these little pellets that get carted onto the field. And then we have a new injection and surface broadcast application. So for gas sampling, which is one of the main objectives of the study, in 2020, I used a photoacoustic gas monitor, which is a field I can bring into the field, it's a field-based instrument, and measure fluxes in real time. I used this instrument because of restrictions from the pandemic. Um, and in 2021, this past field season, I used a different method, um, which required me to take samples in the field, put them in little glass vials, bring them to the lab, and analyze them with a gas chromatograph. And uh, it's been shown that the gas chromatograph in the photoacoustic monitor can provide similar results. So this is um, the fluxes from last year, from 2020. I haven't done any statistical analysis yet. This is literally just a couple of my treatments in the control plot, um, the fluxes from those plots over time. <laughs> and the vertical dash lines represent the treatment days. So what we would expect is after treatment application to see kind of a peak flux and then the mission to decrease over time as some of the inputs from the manure are essentially consumed by the microbes and the less readily, readily available substrates um, are, disappear and are not accessible for decomposition or for, in the case of nitrous oxide, denitrification. So in general, 2020 was pretty dry. So we're not seeing um, that as noticeable of peaks as we might expect, but you can still see a couple of the days post treatment application were a bit higher, and we're generally seeing low fluxes overall. In 2020, some of the differences between the injection plot and the broadcast are more noticeable, but again, the fluxes overall are pretty low, lower than we'd expect because the field isn't pretty dry, um, and the trend was a bit more pronounced later in the growing season after the second treatment application round, and I think that's because it was more wet. And the highest fluxes that we saw at all in 2020 were in late August after Allberg received like about an inch or an inch and a half of rain. So it goes to show how important moisture really is to driving these emissions. Last, for yields, we measured yields um, about six weeks after each application round. And um, so far for the data for both years, we haven't really seen significant differences in the yields between any of the different treatments. Although there was a more significant difference between the new injection and the control plot, but otherwise between injection or surface broadcast with synthetic fertilizer, the yields were pretty comparable. And also just like with the emissions, the yields were pretty low, again, because it's been dry. Um, the, the hay, the grass was just not nearly the height that you would normally expect it to be. And we even harvested, I think, during times when a farmer might not have harvested because it just wasn't the height that you would it to be. Um, last, next steps, I have two more field days. I'm really excited to be wrapping up this project soon. And I'm also really excited to have the chance to finally dig more into the data and start doing more data analysis and also outreach in partnership with UVM Extension. So last, I'd like to thank 
the Ben and Jerry's Carbon Fund, which is funding this research. In addition to my committee, um, Roger Rainville, who owns Board of Research Farm, and his team there, and um, everyone at the Northwest Crops and Soil Program, especially Lindsay, um, for being so helpful and supportive of this project. Um, my peers and postdocs in the Adara, and finally my many different field and lab assistants who have helped me in the field. I really appreciate all the time they put into, into this project. And here are a few photos of various folks in the field. Thank you so much, and I'd love any questions you have. Um, I was wondering if you have data on if you're going to like look at um, data on precipitation and try to graph that eventually. It seems like it could be cool. Yeah, definitely. So fortunately, Borderview has a weather station, nice. and uh, I'm going to look at all their weather data for just in general to know average trends, but also for 2020, 2021. I've also been taking soil moisture measurements every time I'm in the field. And that'll be one of my variables to see how that correlates with the emissions. Um, I guess I'm kind of curious if one of the main issues with the injection was like having a lot of moisture and like it could be in the case of the soil in the wet spring. Is there any like hazard method that like, would you want like, this spring to drive more? Or? Yeah, I think. With injection, you need the manure to be wet because it's you know pumped out of this tank. But like another common method of incorporation is just manure and then incorporating it, like tilling it into the soil. So in that case, your manure wouldn't need to be wet. But I'm not sure to what extent, like how manure injection, the benefits of potentially nitrogen retention, how that would compare when you're just tilling it in. If there would be any differences there, I also um, wonder how the cost would compare. I imagine that just incorporating it in would be cheaper than the new injection. It's pretty expensive. So yeah, there definitely could be some better alternatives from an emissions perspective, but I'm not sure how they would compare either from a water quality or from a nitrogen retention perspective. So there's always these trade-offs, which I think make decision making really hard in your system. I'm curious about the N2O emissions. I mean, they were not drastically different uh, from the previous year. So I'm wondering whether you had any thought about whether that was just because the education was apparently low or that it was high and complete. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I would guess in this case, it's most likely not high and complete just because the soil overall has been so dry. And I did see on that one rainy day, the emissions did increase even though it had been like four or six weeks since the treatment application, which makes me think there's still enough nitrogen in the soil to nitrify and then denitrify, but without the moisture there, it's just not happening. Um, but that is kind of a question I'm exploring in a different study where I'm trying to see if nitrous oxide emissions um, could actually be higher in certain cases just because the soil is not completely denitrified, but I think in this case the soil is not wet enough for the nitrogen to be becoming nitrogen gas. I think, yeah. I, and I, I'm curious if the field was wetter, if we would see higher fluxes, and there's some talk about potentially doing some simulations where we add more water to the field, do like a rainfall simulator, and then see if that impacts emissions. Yeah. Thank you. I'll wrap it up for questions. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah, no, you just gonna have to wonder. It's it's up to the presenters whether they want to share. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so our next speaker is Peter Malicki. Uh, and for his two truths and a lie, um, one, he formerly worked for a private zoo caring for wolves, foxes, skunks, and one porcupine. Uh, two, he used to practice state theater and improv comedy in college. Uh, and three, he has lived for at least a year in four states, but is originally from Minnesota. 
And the title of his talk is Recharging the American Landscape, Evaluating Land Use, Habitat, and Community Impacts Associated with Solar Infrastructure. So Peter, you can go ahead and take it away. All right, love me a clicker. Perfect. Hi everyone, um, my name is Peter Malachy. I'm a dual degree master's student with the Vermont Law School and UVM. Uh, my talk is a little bit different today. Um, um, my advisor is Christopher Brooks, if you know him, uh, but my talk is a little different today because I don't have a research project just yet. In fact, the couple of months, these last couple of months, I've been exploring different projects and, and reaching out to multiple different people. So this talk is a little bit more about the direction I'm hoping to take my project in um, and following up with sort of where my lines in the water are, so to speak. So solar infrastructure has really been something that I'm interested in. And why is that? Well, to start, it's easiest to install compared to other low carbon uh, alternatives. Uh, the main big four are solar, hydrogen, or solar, hydro, uh, wind, and, oh, I forget the last one, but it might, uh, the big part about that is the wind doesn't blow anywhere, everywhere all the time. Um, the water doesn't flow everywhere all the time. And the last one is nuclear. Uh, and so not everyone wants to have a nuke in their backyard. Solar is a little bit more approachable. The sun is everywhere. The second part is many of the internal components can actually be recycled. So this makes this uh, technology very appealing to anyone who is looking to have a long-term solution to their energy problem um, without fewer, uh, without increasing costs to upgrading or um, repairing decommissioned or damaged uh, solar panels. And so that kind of summarizes it into it's cheap. In fact, comparatively, it's probably the most cheap uh, per megawatt hour of energy generated uh, that we have on the market today. Now, this sounds great, but where can it work? I mean, that's the big issue. You know, we don't see solar panels everywhere. Um, it's clear that they only can work in some spots. And the um, capacity, how much we need, really also determines what amount of solar we use in any given spot. So that kind of brings me to the focus of my interest um, is where do we start to put these um, to generate electricity and what kind of land use problems are associated with that? For instance, it takes four acres roughly to put in one megawatt of electricity. For context, Burlington at its peak demand uh, takes in about 69.9 megawatts of electricity. So that's end of the day, everyone's coming home, turning on their lights, turning on their televisions, and that's what we need to sort of think about in terms of any small town, um, any small suburban community that is currently reliant on natural gas or oil. Um, and so when we put this all together, Burlington, takes up about 267 acres of surface area in order to charge it only with solar. Now, again, this being a scientist, you got to understand much, much of this is, is simplified because most energy schemes are a mix of multiple different types of energy. So that wouldn't be the complete number, but if we were only using solar, that's what it would be. An American way to think about this is 202 football fields. So where do we find this space and how do we minimize our impacts to the space as we're using this? In fact, how can we even exploit the opportunities that we have with mixed use um, associated with this sort of essentially land that's doing nothing but taking in the sun? So that, yep, how can we create mixed land use opportunities with solar? How do we change our outlook? Because again, as we're producing energy in our own homes, this changes the way that we think about energy. And then what barriers are we facing with solar infrastructure? So to start, each town and community will have to sort of think about their own renewable infrastructure in their own unique way. Um, this has a lot of spatial um, implications, but plenty of opportunity for mixed use. Mixed use is the idea that uh, you can use this area for multiple different purposes. Think about when you see uh, shops on the bottom of a large building and then apartments above. 
Um, it's not residential. It's not a uh, strictly commercial spot, but it's both. So one big opportunity is potential for habitat. In fact, because the space remains relatively undisturbed after installation, um, there's plenty of po um, possibility for it to be used for wildlife sanctuaries. And in fact, many people have already been establishing pollinator communities in uh, different areas where solar infrastructure has been put in. This has huge implications, especially considering much of America has blighted land just scattered all over the place. This is land that has no farmable value. This is maybe like a remnant of an extractive use like uh, timber or um, surface mining. And if it has the right sort of, um, if it has all of the things that solar needs, why not just put it there? Why not start generating electricity so we can start to see um, smaller uh, pollinator communities, smaller plant communities erupt in these previously blighted areas. Another possibility is accenting agricultural communities. Many of the times, um, certain crops like blueberries grow really well underneath solar arrays, and this can definitely be extended to other shade tolerant uh, crops. Another big thing has been um, some Vermonters, I forget where they're in South Vermont, have been grazing cows right underneath the uh, solar panels. Um, admittedly, they, cows like to scratch themselves, so they'll just push over the solar panel if they get the chance to. But another option would be sheep. You know, those really love the solar panels. In fact, during the summer, it, it's where they hang out. Um, and another big thing is, uh, we have a lot of different farmers markets across Vermont. Um, in fact, I'm sure you guys have been to the Norwich Farmers Market or a similar one where there are actual physical farmer farm stands built um, that you know more established farmers can use. Why not just stick them on top? You know that would be a way to utilize the space as a market um, while also generating electricity for the area um, in a renewable, low carbon way. So let's picture the cows. So this is changing our outlook on renewable energy in a lot of different ways. And to start, we got to think about our first um, standard way that we produce energy. It's centralized, it includes large power plants, and it sort of has this flow from the top to the bottom. Now this is very different from the way that we produce uh, energy with renewables. It's actually far more um, dynamic in that you can have large scale operations, but then you can also have your personal operation that sort of accents your own energy options. Um, in, in fact, I had I put this up here because Australia was just doing this, but Iowa was another person who, or another state that just recently announced that they're transitioning to a microgrid. So the state will be entirely uh, self-dependent on its own power scheme. Um, so this requires new regulation to sort of account for the fact that, you know, you could be your own power producer. That's huge. That's never happened before in the history of America. And this is going to change the way that we think about land all over the place. So what are the barriers? Well, clearly, big oil tycoons, the Simpsons are uh, always on point as usual. Um, they'll pollute until they can't stop. And we need to basically get in there and just get them out of there. Um, this will help sort of push more regulation. It will help encourage people to um, adopt more solar and it will make it a little bit more uh, easy for this infrastructure to be put in. Another thing are local issues. Aesthetics are huge with communities, um, especially more affluent communities. Uh, there are problems associated with people thinking solar panels look gaudy. And so getting into those communities to find ways to make solar more appealing, uh, make it look, you know, uh, understandable um, to someone who might think that, oh, you're going to ruin the neighborhood by putting up solar panels. And the big thing that got me as a biologist interested into this are the habitat implications. Um, the bobo link, as you see in the corner, is one of these threatened birds that is actually further threatened by a solar installation that has been put in, in uh, Middlebury. Um, this has a lot of problems because we can essentially pit two sides of the environmental world together, the energy environmentalist and the habitat environmentalist. And we don't need that. We really need a collective, organized uh, push for renewable energy, especially in the wake of climate change. So 
where my projects are going, um, or in fact, my project. Uh, I have contact with BNRC to study the role of aesthetics, planning uh, PUC approval of solar installations. I'm in contact with a couple of land trusts to sort of look at the ways in which we could incorporate solar into easements or at least uh, look at restoration opportunities associated with that. Um, of course, I've contacted some comments who are looking at this intersectionality in greater detail. And I have a lot of interest in natural communities related to solar, especially shade tolerant plants that are unique to environments strictly around Vermont. You know, building more habitat that is cultivated specifically for these shade tolerant plants could be a really unique opportunity that expands previously unused habitat. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions? So that area is really interesting because a lot of people have been experimenting with uh, photovoltaic uh, cells, especially in windows of all things. So you could imagine a skyscraper just producing electricity for itself. Um, the big problem with that kind of uh, solar, and I would say that to answer your question in a democratic way, that probably would be a large portion of solar that would be implemented because of the land use problems. Um, the thing about that solar, though, is that you can't. Um, many computer, many solar chips have like the ability to track the sun, um, versus like putting it just on the roof. It it kind of just sits there, so um, it can't optimize the amount of energy that it takes in. Um, but it is good at passively generating energy, um, and so of course that's definitely going to be in the mix. Any other questions? Um, you mentioned like planting crops such as blueberries as a solar panel, and I'm wondering how the panels would impact the harvesting of those crops. Yeah, so that would be definitely something where we would need more. Uh, it wouldn't be a, a very efficient system. I mean, I think that that's where it would be easier to do on a small farm that is more organic. Um, but a lot of this stuff is very site specific. Um, most farmers are not really looking to change their operations, but um, new farmers, especially those who kind of come to Vermont for the aesthetic and to start their own little farm, um, that would be more of the scale that we're looking at. It's not really it's something that would be maybe industrial. Um, besides the cows, of course, that's a little bit easier. Frank, for one more quick question. Um, is there one or? If you could just show the slide again with the different energy grid. Oh, this one? Yeah. I was, I was curious then, I don't know about it, but I was curious more about what we're doing. You know, yeah, what would it be to get to that? So it kind of takes the, it, it takes a new look at the way we think about energy. Um, to give you an example, just like, I don't want to reiterate, I guess, but um, imagine a battery uh, and you have, I guess I would imagine most people here have done a little bit of electrical work when they were in high school, maybe like putting a battery next to a light and then tying it with wires. Um, that battery could be ostensibly a power plant, whether it's a gas power plant, a coal power plant, um, it sits in one location and then disperses energy to a community surrounding it. Um, renewables, on the other hand, don't really, because of the way that energy travels, um, you lose a lot of energy when you send it a far away. So what with solar and wind and other types of renewables, it's actually easier and more efficient to keep it closer to home where it's going to be charging it. So this kind of begs the question of how do towns and communities sort of allocate space for this kind of infrastructure? Um, and how do we sort of rework the grid to not only take in energy from multiple different spots, 
but disperse it wherever it needs. So like if the sun's not shining in Colchester, um, how can we get them energy from maybe New York or someplace? So. Not to cut you off, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker will be Al Freeman. Uh, she's a PhD student working with Tony D'Amato. And here are two truths and a lie about Al. So one, she's from Kansas. Two, her full name is Alberta. And three, she is lactose intolerant. Um, she'll be talking today about adaptive silviculture for climate change, physiological responses of seedlings to moderate drought. Okay, well, as Jess said, I'm going to be talking about the physiological response of future adapted seedlings to moderate severity threat. So to get started, um, climate regimes are changing at a faster rate than natural migration has historically been able to keep pace with. And this, is, this inability for species to track climate regimes changing is going to lead to significant lags in natural migration in the future. And this is partly attributed to low dispersal mechanisms of trees, um, habitat fragmentation, which leads to declining habitat suitability, as well as climate constraints. And as a result of this lag, there is increasing interest for land managers to find different strategies to be able to help species migrate into these new and fast changing climate regimes. Because effectively transitioning forests through management will take decades, it's very pressing to kind of figure things out now. This is a major problem that we need to address. And so one way that we do this is to investigate strategies that can help shift our forest towards a more novel approach or create resistance and resilience and um, Kind of resist that change through changing climate regimes. And so three different management strategies have been developed, um, one of which is resistance. The goal of this is to kind of keep um, relatively unchanged structure in the forest. So it's kind of keeping um, the system very similar to historical conditions. Resilience adds a little bit more complexity to the system, but still the overall goal is to maintain that historical condition that we see at the site. And transition is to help transition that site to be a little bit more adaptive. It adds a little bit more complexity. Um, this can include things like creating canopy gaps and planting new species that might not be found on the site. So in general, transition is just a little bit more um, adaptive towards those changing climate regimes. And these three different strategies are an integral part of what's called the Adaptive Civil Culture for Climate Change Network, which is it's a huge project, and it's the largest replicated forest management experience, experiment in the Northeast US. Um, it's been co-produced with land managers, biologists, scientists, and stakeholders. And so it's this huge effort to help come up with really creative and innovative strategies to help reduce climate change impacts on our forest. And so these figures here are from our study site at the Second College Grant. Um, this is one of nine sites that is part of this larger network. And so we have control plots, as you can see here. Um, we have our resistance and resilience and transition have these circles where we've created those gaps. And so this is where a lot of our work has been taking place. And for today's talk, I'm specifically going to be diving into the transition treatment. And how we are transitioning the site is by creating these one acre and quarter acre gaps, and then planting, um, I believe in the one acre gaps, we have 400 seedlings that were planted in 2016 as a form of climate mitigation. So these species are expected to be future adapted to these different climate regimes in this area. Um, so yeah, I will be getting into those details. So for species, we take species that are going to have either a population enrichment. So what this means is these species are at low abundance on the site, but they're still present. And so with those shifting regimes, they're expected to be a much more dominant component of the landscape. In terms of range expansion, we're taking species that are just a little bit 
southern right now, but are expected to be shifting more north. So we're just kind of like, you know, speeding it along for the site. And these species were, we have nine different ones that were selected democratically through a co-developed process that accounted for functional diversity, feature adaptability, and habitat suitability. And so the species include big teeth aspen, black cherry, eastern hemlock, red oak, red spruce, white prime, uh, black or bitternut hickory, black birch, and American chestnut. And so to evaluate the adaptive capacity of these seedlings, I'm applying a physiological lens to this project. Um, and I specifically picked these three species, so red oak, black birch, and American chestnut. I would have loved to measure all nine, but Physiology measurements take a long time. There's a very finite window to sample, so I was only able to select these three, but I was able to have an example of an enrichment planting as well as a range expansion. And understanding how these species respond to current conditions can kind of help give a little bit more insight in how they may respond to future conditions. And more specifically, I'm interested in how they respond to drought. So what's their drought sensitivity? And for some background, it's important to note that in terms of drought response, there's two different strategies that have to do with these stomata. So the refresher in case, you know, you haven't talked about stomata in a bit. So basically the mouth and the nose of the plant. Um, it's where carbon assimilation is happening, water vapor is lost, oxygen is being released. So it's where photosynthesis is occurring. And so species can either be lumped into the isohydric category or an isohydric category. And so an isohydric species has this tight stomatal control. And so if there is increased atmospheric demand for water, you have declining soil water availability, these species can respond by shutting their stomata really rapidly. And so this reduces water loss, but it also reduces that carbon gain. So they're not photosynthesizing as rapidly. Whereas an isohydric species, um, they have this loose stomatal control. So they're going to just keep their stomata open during periods of stress. So they're losing more water, but they're gaining more carbon. And um, if we were to anthropomorphize this, isohydric species are essentially kind of sensitive. They're very, they're not as risky as an isohydric species. And we were fortunate enough to capture a drop this year. Um, so our expectation of these species like black birch, which are isohydric, would shut down their photosynthesis during these peak droughts. Um, well, an isohydric species like red oak would probably just, you know, maintain those photosynthetic rates. And so I can rush them through. Um, to capture the drought sensitivity and behavior of these species, I measured their photosynthetic capacity. Um, and this is essentially, if you measure the photosynthesis, you can get insight into, you know, if they have high rates, means their stomata are open, they're cooking, they're doing their thing, they're fine. Um, if you have lower rates, they're going to have their stomata shut. And this is measured using an LICC 400. Um, it's this amazing piece of equipment here that is also amazingly bulky and very hard to carry up alongside a mountain. Um, but it's a very fun field, field season. And so anyways, we measure photosynthesis. And here you can kind of see, so we measured in early June, mid June, July, and August. And during these peak periods of severe to moderate drought, Black birch, the isohydric species, shut down their photosynthetic rates pretty severely. So again, they're exhibiting that isohydric behavior. American chestnut, which is pretty unique um, to get to study it, there's not a lot of work on this, kind of fell more in that moderate and isohydric species or behavior. Um, their photosynthetic rates kind of just stayed pretty steady throughout the growing season. And the real winner, my favorite, red oak, had increased photosynthetic rates each month. And so again, it's exhibiting that anisohydric behavior. It did not care that there was a drought. It just kept doing its thing, which is really exciting because it could be a really, you know, a winner in terms of future adaptability. And so as we anticipate climate extremes, these species seem to be able to respond in ways that are pretty promising. Um, there's some risk, you know, in maintaining open stomata and photosynthesizing during periods of drought, especially if it's a persistent and severe drought, but there's also some pretty big gains. So red oak likely will be able to establish more rapidly, um, have higher growth rates due to that, you know, increased carbon gain. So it could occupy space that becomes available with these shifting climate regimes. 
On black birch, although it may be more sensitive, there is the potential that it could still perform well. Um, it does like moisture conditions, so it's kind of hard to say. Which leads me to what I'm most excited about. Um, for my future work, I'm actually going to be exposing these seedlings to precipitation exclusions. And the goal is really to determine um, mechanistic mortality thresholds. So figuring out how much stress can these species actually take before we start seeing declines in survival. And so that will give a better idea of the actual adaptive capacity of these seedlings and the utility of using transition um, management strategies. I think that's probably time. So with that, I'd like to thank my advisor, Tony, um, Pam McIntyre with the Forest Service, who let me steal all his equipment this summer, William Smith and Rufio, my steel techs, and have another Jess and Pete Park for all their health this summer. I would say so. I think species that typically fall as anisohydrates, so those risk takers, if you have a more persistent and long drought you might see greater mortality of those species, whereas isohydric species will probably be okay. But on the reverse side of that, um, if you were to just have those quick extreme events, then isohydric species would probably perform better. In terms of like extreme precipitation, I'm not exactly sure. Um, that is something I'm considering adding to the site to see how they respond to that. Um, yeah, it's just hard to say. Yeah. 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 But if they have increased access to CO2. Sorry. Are you saying like if they have increased access to CO2? Yeah. Um so Possibly, I don't. The issue is that there's not not enough CO2 for them to um, assimilate. The issue is just more if you don't have enough water, you're gonna start getting issues with like embolisms and the xylem. So it's more of like a heat and drought than uh, limiting CO2. So I'd say those are the bigger drivers, especially heat. Heat really um, kind of a thin nail in the coffin. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, well, so they do that in response to like if there is water stress um, so that they don't keep losing water because whenever their smog is open, they're actively losing water. Um, they'll close those, their stomata. And so you have less water loss, but you start to consume more of your carbon. And so you can start having issues with non-structural carbohydrate starvation. Um, yeah, it's kind of challenging to determine what, what how increased CO2 will impact them. Yeah. Any other questions? We could do one extremely quick question, or, um, or we could talk with about the next person. Thanks. Okay, so next up we'll have Soren Donisvich. He's a master's student working with Tony D'Amato. And uh, for two truths and a lie about Soren, one, he has eight siblings. Two, his favorite tree species is the eastern white pine. And three, he loves hot, humid days. I have to say, I'm curious about this one, so I hope he tells us the answer. Um, but Soren, you can go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Jeff. So, 
Um, so today I'm going to be talking about, uh, first off, my name is Soren Donis, which thanks just for introducing me. Um, I'm working with Tony, and my work is partially funded through the ACID grant and the EFIN uh, program that the FDMC is creating, which is an aggregating these continuous forest inventory data sets across the Northeast that will hopefully be able to ingest and digest um, these programs and make them available widely to researchers and land managers in the future. Part of my uh, research does incorporate this data set. So basically, what are my research questions? Um, so I'm really interested and in, we are really interested in how our regional forests changing. Um, this can be kind of funneled down to what are the drivers of variation and the functional diversity in the forest dynamics across the northern northeast United States. Um, this other aspect of data enhancement could be incorporated at a smaller geographic scale. I do want to preface this entire uh, demonstration or talk about that uh, my findings are still in the modeling phase to determine these functional drivers, so I don't have those outputs, but I do have preliminary um, findings as far as the data enhancement impacts. So basically what is the data that I'm actually using for this analysis is continuous forest inventory data. Um, you can think about going into the forests and sampling a plot that's you're measuring all the trees and a number of different metrics of those trees, but you're able to do that through time. So you're, so you're able to build a statistically significant way of uh, evaluating time and change and being able to see trends and other functional characteristics of forest dynamics. Who actually takes this data? The most prevalent and widely used data set or CFI data set is from the FIA. Um, roughly after their previous in the early 2000s, there's roughly one plot for every 6,000 acres. Um, the Northern Forest Service Research Station um, has recently uh, added in regeneration plot data um, that's just kind of really coming online to have a look at uh, regeneration and growth. And I'm super excited to be able to incorporate that. Um, the thing is, is that FIA has not always been the most, uh, the best uh, data set to be able to look at some questions. Therefore, other numerous private and public institutions have incorporated their own CFI data sets, maybe at smaller spatial resolutions to answer different questions. The issue is though, there's a number of enormous amount of these uh, programs that are uh, often unleveraged when actually dealing with regional assessment for questions. So basically, I have two uh, steps to my, uh, my analysis is we have a regional question where we're looking at those uh, kind of trends and what are the actual functional drivers of those trends in the forest. Um, and then also this data enhancement question with the FI plots, the fuzz location are in red and the enhanced data sets of those conglomerate of other data sets that I'm incorporating, really seeing how that actually impacts trends within the forest. So basically, what am I measuring? What are the metrics I'm using to uh, consider change? Um, it is something to be considered that I'm not looking so much at species, but rather functional diversity, which is kind of a change. Um, I don't have time to go into that concept, but I'll try to breeze through it and kind of understand as easy as possible. Um, but I'm looking so far as diversity. You can see uh, Shannon's diversity index in a way that's unidimensional, looking at maybe frequency or range of the current um, abundance in forestry or rather in forest ecology and very interesting to get into because you're both considering uh, frequency of occurrence but also relative size. We probably do that with basal area. If you consider like taking the cross-sectional area of a tree, you're able to incorporate the relative size of that tree in that area. Um, and then above ground like carbon or biomass really takes that to that third dimension that um, uh, it's not only frequency and relative size to area but also the the three-dimensional volume that species or functional trait picks up. And these functional traits uh, are commonly used as functional trait diversity. You're looking at the range, value, distribution, relative abundance of the functional traits that comprise that, um, uh, that ecosystem. And so what I'm looking at is the general trends over time, how are the forest changes based on these functional diversity indices. And um, also I'll be incorporating overstory and understory analysis that's able to look at the, the general makeup of the functional trait diversity in the overstory compared to the understory, really able to guess what are the forests we have and what the forest we might have in the future. So I'll try to speak about this, um, but so the idea of functional traits is that instead of thinking about a landscape or an ecological system based on the species that comprise it, you think of it instead of as what are the functional traits, the population traits that comprise and make up how that ecosystem functions. 
Um, this is far more applicable across regional and global scales as you're able to compete more accurate comparison. Um, this gets to where I really am at with my research is currently I've aggregated these data for the data set analysis and then I'm currently in the way of modeling what are um, the actual independent variables or those drivers of change. I'll be looking at um, functional change of functional traits across the region and change in functional diversity, change of functional abundance, all with a large number of ever growing lists of uh, functional traits such as still models to conduct this uh, specific gravity, um, as well as community traits that's like mortality, in growth, um, stuff like that, and then population change like this frequency. Also, when you incorporate climatic variables, um, that may be also very impactful as far as change. Um, as far as the preliminary analysis for the data enhancement, this is also this is just in the spatially constrained Massachusetts only. Um, this is just a proof of concept of what data enhancement can do. The figure on the right, as you can see, um, the blue, the Nikon data is this aggregate of all of these CFI programs, um, FIA, and then FIA Nikon data enhanced version. Really, this is the important study we talked about before. It takes into consideration both frequency and also relative size. And so it gives a good understanding of what species or in turn the functional traits, how important are those in this, in this aggregated data set. Um, so if you're going to be using something, you usually want to go with a great larger number of Canada's diversity index. Um, and you can see right here what ends up happening if you're looking at species and subsequently functional traits, it's better to go with the data set that has the most. And this really kind of lends itself to what data enhancement really does. You're able to pick up on these less frequent, far less frequent species because you're just increasing the sample size, increasing that and the more probability that you're able to pick up those rare species on the landscape. Um, as far as some general trends, uh, these graphs um, are just supposed to indicate the rough uh, trends over time for these data sets and what data and have actually does to these trends. Um, if you look at TPA, that's trees per acre, so that's like that frequency or that density. Um, there's in general in Massachusetts, you can see that there's a general uh, trend down. Um, based on these cars, I wouldn't be predicting into the future on this. Uh, kind of very difficult, and these are very you know, widely ranged and very ecologically different systems. Um, but you can see how the data set enhancement does impact uh, uh, confidence interval uh, within the uh, best fit linear trend within our data set that we have, um, as well as for basal area. Just because we're losing the density of trees doesn't always mean a bad thing. The general basal area is representative. Those trees that are there are growing. They're growing at a fairly consistent rate. Uh, quadratic mean diameter uh, is just the diameter, which is the way you measure a tree. It's just the diameter at the site that you measure in a quadratic transformation just it weights the summary towards the larger trees within a given area. So the larger trees in an area on average are consistently growing, which is good to see. So like people at the harvesting, um, they're not being cut down as much, or maybe indicative of that. And really the data set enhancement, all you can see is it kind of uh, best of both worlds, reduce reduction of standard error and standard deviation, and then kind of takes into consideration just kind of pull out two things. But um, yeah, I'd like to rehash with the fact that I don't have the outputs for the general trends for the functional drivers of general trends in English, but in the regional area, but I'm going to be very excited to be able to do that in the future. Questions? Uh, for two truths and a lie, uh, I do have eight siblings. I do not like them to ghost. Okay, uh, we still have some time for questions. Can you talk a little bit about the functional traits that you selected or that are in the data? And um, I don't know, just talk about what you're measuring. Yeah, so there are a number of large studies such as um, uh, still model conductions, um, specific gravity of the wood, seed mass, all of these um, can be related to specific functions of that species or the traits those species. Uh, are, what they comprise 
And when you sum that to an overall ecosystem, you can see what specific functional traits um, comprise that ecosystem. And so what I'm doing is, is like, I'm going to get a bunch of all the trees that you have and the tree species and attribute the functional traits that are associated with those tree species. From that modeling, I'm able to determine based on the change, what are the functional drivers, what specific functional traits may best ex like explain why regional forests are changing or how they are changing. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, well, I, I look at functional traits for insects, for example, and we look at functional traits like, depending on the change that we're looking at. So we're looking at the outcome of the functional traits that would make them more level of so I was just curious about whether you were looking at functional traits in particular to a particular question or just functional traits in general related to trees. Um, more, it's more generalized and more about less the specifics of what they are doing and more just the, the specific true. functional trait actually is explaining the change within a given region. Um, as far as like determining what that what that impact is, is beyond the scope of the study. All right, in that case, thank you, Soren. We still have a couple more minutes before our next speaker. So, um, relax for a moment. All right, folks, uh, we'll get ready to introduce our next speaker.
so coming up next, we have Daniel Pratson. He is a PhD student who works with Rochelle Gould, Brendan Fisher, and Tony D'Amato uh, for some truths and a lie about Daniel. Um, one, he summited Arizona's highest peak last February. Two, he has never, ever mispronounced my last name, Michael, ever. And three, he has sailed from Virginia to Halifax, Nova Scotia. And uh, I can't say which one of those is true or not either. <laughs> He'll be talking today about understanding the receptiveness of respondents to ecological economics principles in the context of extreme weather events and climate change. Take it away, Daniel. Yes, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk a little bit about a project that I've been working on the past few months here. Um, Somewhat tangentially, I guess, related to my dissertation work, but interesting nonetheless. Um, so, to kind of begin and sort of reiterate some of the things we've heard from other presenters, um, severe weather or extreme weather events are an issue in the US. Um, you know, there are 22 different events in the last year alone that resulted in at least a billion dollars in damages. So, there's a lot of economic damage, but then also you know, another one of the issues, I guess, is that they're very widespread throughout the U.S. They're not just um, sort of concentrated in one geographic location. Um, however, despite the sort of large economic uh, detriment and um, sort of widespread nature of some events, there's a bit of dissonance between um, attributing these events to climate change and then further support of climate policy. So um, there's this probably knows this, but a high division of mistrust around um, sort of ushering in climate policy. And this is often attributed to some detriments or threats to the economy. So people are sort of, kind of creating this bifurcation between economic well-being and uh, environmental well-being. That's where ecological, uh, so I put this in, I just felt like this totally captured this kind of sentiment in terms of like, the world's burning down, but what about the economy here? <laughs> so anyway, that's where ecological economics comes in. Um, ecological economics is this transdisciplinary endeavor that sort of is focused around the idea of the earth being this finite system um, and the economy being a subset and existing within the boundaries of this finite system. Um, and so I have been interested in kind of using ecological economics as a way to frame um, questions and statements to then try to decrease thinking around that, uh, I guess, divide that people might you know, create between the environment and the economy. So I'm interested in kind of seeing if what are people thinking about um, the, in the relationship between the environment and economy in a way that are similar to ecological economics principles. Um, and is there any linkage to um, living in extreme weather events and resulting attitude around economy and environment, which leads me to my two research questions here. So how are people thinking about this relationship and what factors really uh, predict that um, sort of thinking, especially in regards to extreme weather events and kind of that learned attributed experience um, with extreme weather events. So to um, test these research questions, I was part of a team that developed a pretty large scale online survey that went out during the winter of I guess, this year and last um, December and January. And the survey was over Qualtrics and was disseminated to individuals in the West, the Southeast and the Northeast to try to capture certain regions that are going through um, kind of high frequencies of extreme weather events. So wildfires in the West, um, tropical storms and hurricanes, in the southeast and then relatively you know few uh, extreme weather events in the northeast but as many we pointed out you know, we still do get effects of hurricanes um, tropical storms. so um, those are the regions we targeted and i put in a few different questions and statements in this uh, survey to sort of gauge people's sort of views around economy uh, environment trade-offs here so um, so the first question or statement that I asked, I had people sort of indicate whether or not they agreed or disagreed with the statement about addressing climate change, and sort of um, long-term economic growth and whether or not that is affected by addressing climate change. I also asked, I'll go back to these during the analysis, but 
I also ask people to identify what they think the best sort of um, indicator um, that uh, sort of indicates the relationship between the environment and the economy. So how people really think about the two together, if they were uh, separate or different, um, if one sort of uh, affected the other here. And then I also developed uh, three different sort of graphics that tried to mirror those statements in the previous slide. And so um, some half of the respondents got these pictures, these graphics, and half of the respondents um, got these questions, and all the respondents got this one. So trying to see you know, how people respond to these certain questions here. So super raw um, just frequencies for this first statement, you know, whether or not people agree. Um, to address climate change now and whether or not that will impact economic growth. And uh, it's kind of good to see that most people in this in this survey population did either slightly or straight, slightly too strongly agree that uh, this is something that they agreed with. That agree a lot there. It's my apologies. But less than or around 18%, you know, disagree with this. So just so sort of off the bat, we're seeing that many people do kind of are thinking in a way that doesn't necessarily attribute um, a strong difference between the economy and the environment. Same thing with the second question. Um, most people chose that, or indicated that they felt that the health of the economy depended on the health of the natural environment. So these two were kind of interrelated and um, connected to one another. And for the uh, graphic question, it was a bit more of a mixed bag. Um, most people chose the statement or the, the graphic that I felt was sort of indicative of the economy and the environment being separate from one another. But as many people have indicated, you know, you can, there's a lot of ways to interpret um, these different graphics. So, um, yeah, it was just sort of an interesting result to come up from this survey right here. So, I also ran a series of logistic regressions to try to predict what factors led to how people chose these certain things. Um, and so the independent variables that are highlighted and not grayed out are the ones that have statistical significance. And basically what we're seeing here is that as people attribute events to climate change, the events that they've experienced, um, they are more likely to agree with the statement of, you know, um, prioritizing the environment and economy now. Interestingly enough, though, there's sort of a, a negative relationship between exposure to extreme weather events. So the more extreme weather events people have been involved with, the less likely they are to agree with that statement. Same with living in the southeast, but again, there's a very small coefficients and sort of weakly proven, as opposed to liberal or moderate or having a strong attribution to climate change. I also ran a model looking at um, just sort of indicating what, what type of relationship people feel between the environment and the economy is. Um, and these negative uh, coefficients essentially state that um, as attribution increases, there's a less likely chance that these individuals will indicate that you know, the environment harms the health of the economy or the environment is not related to one another. So just kind of these, these negative coefficients indicate what we found earlier that um, attribution, and then in this case, the addition of age and salary, as well as moderate or liberal meaning, um, there's a lower chance of agreeing with these two statements, or a higher chance of agreeing that um, the economy and the environment are closely related to one another. But again, we see this extreme weather event exposure still has, um, as people are exposed to more extreme weather events, they um, actually are sort of likely to indicate that protecting the natural environment might harm the health of the economy. And then I'm in the last uh, model just to see you know, who shows these graphics here. Um, and so this is sort of saying that as age increases, there's a less likely chance of choosing this sort of ecological economics framing um, or this kind of economy taking the front seat. Um, but then as uh, people sort of lean more liberal or the salary increases, they are more likely to kind of be in this camp here. So sort of takeaways from these dense tables of data here. I'm finding that ideology and political views, or ideology in terms of political views and attribution of um, extreme weather events to climate change are much stronger predictors than the experience themselves. And as we see, the 
sort of being in an extreme weather event doesn't necessarily relate to views uh, that are kind of captured in our ecological economics mindset. They might actually be sort of opposite of that. Um, we see just sort of by frequency, a majority of the respondents do align to the kind of thinking that there isn't necessarily this difference between the two um, in terms of environment and economy. Um, and then also additional demographics such as age and salary might play a role in informing these views here. So um, just want to acknowledge the team that I've been working with um, and the uh, just slew of graduate students and um, colleagues that have been sort of advising me and just giving me advice as moving forward. Um, and then the funding that I have for uh, this project. So happy to answer any questions, taking feedback. Um, I appreciate your time and attention. Steven should go on there as well. Too. He's helping me with this. This is data missing. You're missing data. Yeah, okay. uh, I have a question about, so in the survey, I'm assuming there are like a lot of other questions too. Yeah. Were there any questions to ask about people's personal experience with extreme weather events or was that more just attributed to where they went? Uh, great question. So we've measured experience by sort of frequency, like how many extreme weather events have has an individual experience within the last five years. And they, were, they were able to indicate how many and then um, how intense of an event that was. So these individuals were asked to rank on the scale of 1 to 10 how intense those events were um, by the damages that they caused. So we kind of created this proxy and combined the two to sort of, we lumped those together to sort of be exposure to these events. And that's what I meant. So, yeah. Yes. Um, so I think that's what you did on this uh, it's a great question. So the Qualtrics is sort of involved with creating these panels of survey participants. They get paid a very small amount of money per survey, and then you're able to take them on your phone and online. So um, we got a fairly, I can show you, um, a fairly sort of large, uh, sorry, let me think of this. There is a decent amount of people that answer this from all walks of life. Um, and yeah, they were paid to sort of take this survey amongst many other surveys too. But this is sort of kind of a breakdown of uh, who participated in the survey itself. It was huge. We had over 6,000 um, responses that were valid and over 9,000 totals. So there was a lot of survey participants here. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. To, to what extent is this motivation matched? Of the, uh, of the That's a great question, and I'm working into that now, sort of by population and by demographics. Um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but that is one um, sort of data cleaning step that I've been going in. Term, you know, we asked about who people voted for in the election, so there's a lot of sort of actual data that we can sort of compare to the the survey data that we have to get kind of figure out how representative of a sample that we're pulling from here. So, yeah, there we go. I was curious if you look at like the relationship between um, how frequently people report these habits and their politics. I wonder if it's like geographically, like people in, in more like traditionally red areas might like, also just think like that they look more connected. Yeah, so in terms of like the, the political breakdown per, yeah, per region. Yeah. Yeah, so we did ask like what specific extreme weather events people had experienced. Um, but in these analyses, I just sort of lumped them all together and just sort of it was the frequency of extreme weather events, be that hurricanes or wildfires or whatever. So it was just kind of like an aggregate of all the responses. But yeah, there, there is the ability to kind of parse it out even further by the region and type of extreme weather event as well. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. You can take this one. Okay. Last question. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I noticed that you didn't include uh, conservative 
two points, and did you do surveys for that, and did you see any differences based yeah. on age? Yeah, good catch. Yeah, so that dropped out of the model, and I, I'm trying to figure that out right now. So yes, we did capture people that uh, answered, you know, kind of indicated that they were more concerned with leaning, um, but yeah, it was just sort of didn't crop in in the model that I was using. So yeah, totally worth um, figuring that out. But yeah, good question. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. All right, we made it to our final speaker of the night. Uh, so Sophie Marinese will be our last speaker. She's a master's student who works with Tony D'Amato in the AMP program. For a little bit more about Sophie, she grew up hiking in the White Mountains. She enjoys skiing in the winter. She owns two cats, and her favorite food is raspberries. And her talk will be on drivers of soil organic carbon storage in rich northern hardwood forests. Alrighty, hello. My name is Sophia Marinis, um, and as she said, I will be discussing drivers of soil organic carbon storage in rich northern hardwood forests. All right. So a little bit of background. Forests hold a lot of value to us, including recreational value, economic value, um, intrinsic value. But in this presentation, I will be investigating the value of carbon storage and climate change mitigation regarding that. So in our forests, there's a lot of potential for this and more and more they're being managed for carbon storage. So this is a very important thing in forestry. They sequester carbon not only in just the trees, which we typically think about, but also in you know, the downwind material and any of the leaf litter. But pertaining to this particular study, I'm focusing on the carbon in the soil or soil organic carbon. So this soil organic carbon is impacted by many things from you know, the pH of the soil to aggregation, the hydrology, um, but also the vegetation on site. Um, such as conifer versus hardwood, um, the litter input from those can greatly affect the soil organic carbon storage. So the Vermont Forest Carbon Sequestration Group put out a report in 2020 stating that approximately 15% of the United States car carbon dioxide emissions has been sequestered in forests. In New England, it comes in at about 35%, and Vermont, it's up to about 50%. So this is a really important natural resource for us. Additionally, approximately two thirds of the carbon in a forest is actually in the soil. Because a lot of times we focus on the above ground carbon in the trees and downwind material, but a large portion is actually held in the ground. Additionally, across the globe, approximately 70% of the soil organic carbon is also in forests. So this kind of culminates in that this is a really important thing to study. Climate change impacts our forests, but additionally things that we have introduced into our forests paired with climate change also um, are threats to their integrity. One such thing is um, the emerald ash borer, which a lot of us probably know about, and that is a threat to all of our ash species, white ash, green ash, black ash, um, and this is a really big issue if your forest has a very large ash basal area. Additionally, earthworms are also non-native, which normally we think of them as being good in our gardens and whatnot, but in a forest they play a very different role. So back when the glaciers came down from Canada, um, in the northeast they scraped off all of the soil, the topsoil, and they kind of extirpated the earthworms from our area. With that being said, the soils were able to develop for a very long time without any earthworms in them. So when they were reintroduced by settlers from both Europe and Asia, when they brought over kind of cultivating goods like produce and whatnot to grow here, um, they were introduced. And additionally, you know, in more recent times when people go fishing, they buy night crawlers and other types of worms. They don't use them all, they just dump them out. So this has all led to a reintroduction process that our soils didn't have for so long. With that being said, earthworms are ecosystem engineers and they basically, they move nutrients through the soils much more quickly than otherwise would be. Um, with that comes the deterioration of the leaf litter at a much higher rate than otherwise what we would see. Um, with that, that leads to the potential for it to affect the carbon in the soils. 
Um, additionally, regarding the Emerald Ash Core, um, it's interesting to look at if there is an impact of ash on the soil organic carbon in a forest, because if we're losing them from our forest with great mortality, we just need to know how they fit into the system. So a little bit of background about the site that I'm currently working on. Um, it's located right there with a little blue star in the green map. Um, it's called the O.C. Clements Woodlot. It's in Corinth, Vermont, and owned by Dartmouth College. Um, this figure right here is an outline of the actual site itself. The green is where I've been sampling from, not the little dots or the, uh, the plots. It's considered a rich northern hardwood forest, and it has a very high content of ash, a very large percentage of basal area. So with that being said, emerald ash borer is a potential threat to this forest. It has not yet reached it, but it's been found in surrounding areas in a lot of Vermont. Additionally, there are earthworms on site. So with these two things um, coming into play, my two research questions are, first, what are the primary drivers of soil organic carbon storage in rich northern hardwood systems? And what is the influence of white ash on soil properties and how might this be affected by the introduction of emerald ash borer? So this is important because these two things kind of tie together, but you have to kind of know how all the different pieces of the system work together to store the carbon, but if ash play a big role in that, it's important to know that because if we do lose them, then we need to know what might happen and how they actually have played a role previously. A little bit about my methods. So as you saw before in the map, there were 122 survey plots across the site. Um, they were established in the summer of 2020. They were established and they measure things such as basal area of overstory trees, and the species of those, they took measurements of seedling plots. Um, they also surveyed for worms on site, and they did a ranking system of one through five, one being the least present, uh, being the most. Um, and that was done looking at indicators on site of worms. So I came in in August of 2020 and did soil and leaf litter sampling. So as you can see in the picture in the middle right there, there's a little frame that's 15 by 15 centimeters. I collected leaf litter from there. I also took a sample of soil from zero to 10 centimeters and a soil core. I've been working on processing these in over at the George D. Ginsburg Street Lab. Um, I'm looking at soil carbon in the zero to 10 centimeters and in the cores, um, and I've run those through a muscle furnace by combustion. And I'm also looking to analyze the um, carbon to nitrogen ratio in both the litter and a subset of those samples. So some initial results really quickly. Um, I haven't gotten a huge amount into the data processing yet, um, just because I've been spending a lot of time in the lab trying to get to the point where I have a data set. But to begin, I investigated how worm stage might affect average percent carbon in the 0 to 10 category. And this came up with a significant p value from just a running of basic ANOVA. Um, and so this does indicate that earthworm invasion might significantly affect soil carbon. Additionally, I found that the same thing worm stage compared against the average collected litter mass from the 15 by 15 centimeter frame also had a significant p value. So kind of combining these two results indicate that there potentially is some effect of earthworms on the carbon storage and the factors that impact carbon. Lastly, the last thing that I quickly ran some analysis on was um, and found some possible interest in is um, basal area of ash has a significant effect on separated woody material from the leaf litter. Um, because I looked at both the entire mass of leaf litter and then I looked at the woody versus the non-woody. So that's like all the little, little sticks and twigs and whatnot. Um, and so this is very preliminary, but this does indicate that once I get a little further into my analyses, that there might be something there regarding the significance between ash and the carbon storage. So my next steps will be to incorporate the soil core data because that goes a little, a little further into the soil profile, um, which hopefully will give a little bit better of a well-rounded analysis. And from there, I can look at what I've what I've already examined and kind of start to create an AC table to use for model selection to determine key factors um, in driving soil carbon storage across the site. And that is really looking to kind of culminate 
the, um, the whole process of determining which things actually are important. Is it the pH? Is it the basal area? Is it then combined together? So that would hopefully be my final product of this kind of whole thing to be able to look at all these different pieces together. I'd like to thank my advisor, Tony D'Amato, for a huge amount of help. Um, Car and Rand, um, we're in English, we're all there in the class and all the people helping me out in the lab. That has been amazing help. Um, and I have a whole host of technicians that have been helping me all over the place, running all over. Um, and I'd also like to thank the people at Dartmouth College for helping me out with this whole project. Thank you. Great questions for Sophie. Did you try to identify the worms at all? So, okay, so the way that we did it was just kind of a ranking system. You can do a version of figuring out how many worms are on site by actually pouring, I think it's water mixed with like mustard something powder, but we didn't do that because the site I'm on is kind of hilly. It's very expansive and you need a lot of water for that. So that would be a lot of effort to carry a lot out there, um, but they were looking for worm middens, how much litter there was, um, that kind of stuff to indicate it. Um, and doing that based off of like how, how far apart and how present they were in a plot um, was just a much easier way to do that when you're already measuring so many other factors on one site. So unfortunately, no. Got it. But, cool. All right, well, in that case, I think the uh, reception is going to start in the solarium in a few minutes, so we can head down there shortly. Let's do one more round of applause for all the awesome presentations tonight. Thank <laughs> you.